I invite you all to stand as we enter this time of worship and talk about all the wonderful great things that God has done. this morning. 
listening. And for those of you who perhaps don't know Pastor Deb, uh, she's been a pastor at Greenville Free Methodist Church here in town, as well as Free Methodist Churches in Kansas and Indianapolis and New York as well. So we're super excited to have her with us this morning. Um, to continue in worship, I've, I've invited um, one of our resident directors, so Leon Chess. Yeah! Uh, and she has written it out for me, I, so I'm not really translating, I'm just reading Sophie's translation for us, so don't think I'm that smart up here, okay? Alright, so let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, Señor Todopoderoso. Oh, Almighty God. Hoy día te damos bienvenido en este lugar. We invite you into this place today. Abre nuestros corazones, nuestros ojos llenos de sueño. Open our hearts, our sleepy eyes. A lo que quieres hacer to what you want to do. No merecemos tu bondad ni tu paciencia. We don't deserve your goodness or patience. Pero te damos un mil de gracias por darnos los. But we give you a thousand thank yous for giving them anyway. Estamos aquí para encontrarte, experimentarte, alabarte. We are here to find you, experience you, to worship you. En el santo nombre de tu hijo. Amen. In the name and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we continue to worship through song. Let us declare that his mercy is more together. Father God, we just thank you 
for being present in this space, and we thank you for letting us gather here today as a campus just to worship you and learn more about you, Lord. I pray for Deb that you can speak through her, Lord, and I pray for all of us that we can um, receive your message with open hearts and open minds, Lord. I pray all of this in your amazing and precious name. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Good morning. such a privilege to worship in all of you here today. This space has held a lot of memories for me over the years, uh, beginning about, well, give or take, 53 years ago when I was a freshman here, taking my required PE class. Uh, there was a house where Deacon stands right now, and that's where I was living. Anything before 9 o'clock was way too early for me because I didn't think Jesus was even awake then. But I had to come down the hill, come in this space, take my PE class. Like I said, thankfully Jesus wasn't up, which was probably good since I had to skip. I didn't have to. I managed to skip a few of those classes. Shame to say. When your, uh, when your chaplain invited me to speak, she explained that the theme for the fall tweet gatherings, the primary question was, who do you say that I am? She also assigned a specific text, which I always appreciate. But truth be told, I did harbor just a little bit of frustration, Kelly, uh, over the text, because in some ways it felt really kind of truncated, you know, sort of incomplete. I mean, there, there were aspects of this narrative, there was some really juicy stuff that I knew that I was going to have to leave for next week's speaker, uh, Pastor Steve McCaskey who's going to go deeper into the text. But the more time I spend with these first 14 verses, uh, the more both comfortable and thankful that I, I was for, for this particular passage. I'm speaking, of course, of John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Now, for anybody in the room who might be uh, familiar with the passage, it's kind of a unicorn of a conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. I'll explain why I say that in just a few moments. Um, but if, if you know the passage, you kind of know uh, where I'm going because the story doesn't just end at verse 14. It more or less concludes all the way over to verse 42. Now, if you have your Bibles or your devices, feel free to look up John 4, and we're going to read together those first 14 verses. In our, our gospel lesson this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand while I read this passage. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near a plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is asking you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will come, will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks. Thank you, sir. Now, at first blush, this, this might not seem all that radical of an encounter, but context is very, very important here. Jesus crosses strict uh, cultural boundaries separating races and gender and moral status. And he points to the new and ultimate unity in the Holy Spirit. Now, for the sake of time, I'm simply going to give some bullet points that I hope will contribute to uh, kind of a deeper understanding, not only of the uniqueness of the conversation, but first and foremost, of the radical nature of Jesus to pursue everyone with his love and with his compassion. So we're going to stay there for a few minutes as I kind of unpack that. You see, pilgrims traveling to and from Jerusalem for various feasts could travel around Samaria, but many would just take a shorter route right through Samaria. Granted, Jews and Samaritans worshipped the same God and both observed the laws of Moses, although the Samaritans might have tweaked some of that a little bit. But they despised one another's places of worship. And they had remained hostile toward one another for, for centuries. The meeting place, Jacob's well, which I'll elaborate on in just a few more minutes, it is still known and visited today. You can Google it. It is within view of Mount Gerizim, which is a holy site to the Samaritans. Now, most of us Westerners don't fully grasp the significance of holy geography. I don't think in high school we ever had Holy Geography 101, right? But ancient peoples were attracted to such holy sites and they held them in very high regard. So there's this additional aspect of a geographical component to this narrative as well. Not only Samaria itself, but also um, the, the well, this, this place, um, sacred space. Let's also consider the, the time of day. The sixth hour normally means about noon. So Jesus and his disciples had evidently gotten a fairly early start. I'm going to have to try and maybe avoid the higher temperatures of midday. The local women would most definitely not come to draw water in the midday heat. But this woman had to do so by herself. Which leads us to the next one. The fact that she came alone, rather than in the company of other women, most likely indicated that the rest of the women of Sychar just didn't like her. In this case, because of her previous and even her present relationships with men. I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story. I'm going to leave that with next week's speaker to unpack for a bit of a teaser for next, next Wednesday. And then there's the obvious fact that Jesus, uh, a man, was even talking to a woman. Here's the unicorn aspect of this, of this text. Although Je Jewish teachers warned against, you know, talking much with women in general, I mean, what was there to be gained from that, after all? They would have especially avoided Samaritan women who they declared were unclean from birth. Other ancient accounts show that even asking water of a woman could be interpreted as flirting with her, especially if she had come alone due to a certain reputation. So here's Jesus breaking all the rules of Jewish piety. Then you have the well. Images of water and wells were often used uh, symbolically in antiquity. In this case, however, there was something going on that was quite literal. This particular well is where Isaac, if you read from Genesis 24, and Jacob from Genesis 29, it's where they met their wives. And this was common knowledge among the Jewish locals. So, you can just imagine some busy bodies connecting dots, or at the very least, you know, entertaining a, a certain level of suspicion that the religious people of the day would most certainly prefer to avoid altogether. Jesus, this woman, at this well. I mean, all, all of this potential for scandal over a simple request for a drink of water on 
a very hot day. But perhaps the greatest scandal of all, the greatest misunderstanding, was with the water. Jesus needed a drink. But how much more did this woman need life-giving water? Some might assume that living water simply meant fresh or flowing, you know, as opposed to stagnant water or just well water. But this author, John, was well known for his double meanings. And in the previous chapter, John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's yes. born again. And he talked yes. about double yes. meanings. Yes. It was also well known that rabbis spoke of Torah or of the law as God's gift and as living water. Isaiah 12 reads, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In Jeremiah 2, here's God speaking. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. But John uses the symbolism of living water differently to refer to the Holy Spirit. I mean, just listen to Jesus' words later on in the seventh chapter of John's Gospel, beginning in verse 37. On the final and climactic day of the feast, Jesus took his stand. He cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will brim and spill out the depths of anyone who believes in me this way, just as the scripture says. He said this in regard to the Spirit whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Rivers of living water. And let's face it, water is pretty important to our bodies. Among many other benefits, it helps uh, regulate body temperature, it protects body organs and tissues. It carries nutrients and oxygen to the cells. It lubricates joints. It lessens the burdens on the kidneys and the liver by flushing out waste. The human body is made up, at least for women, about 55% water. For men, about 60% water. And here stands Jesus, meeting us at the point of our of one of our most basic human needs. He demonstrates his identity with each and every one of us through his thirst. The guy needed a drink. I mean, he was fully human, after all. But then, he would go on to seek out those who didn't even know that they were seeking in the first place to offer a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I mean, he was fully divine, after all. Is it possible that sometimes we make this thirst-quenching thing just a little too complicated? Jesus says, come and drink of living water. But we want to know about the electrolytes first. Or maybe we feel the need to add a little flavor. Or, or, or an energy boost, or caffeine, or vitamin, something that an ordinary bottle of water just can't satisfy. Plus, we got to know if it's spring water, or mineral water, or distilled water, or alkaline water, or sparkling water. Maybe we carry with us some level of implicit bias about our own preferences. <laughs> Let me further illustrate. Google tells me, and I believe everything Google says, by the way. <laughs> Google tells me that there are presently 127 different labels, just labels, for bottled water around the world. Now, that seems kind of low to me, but those 127 labels don't include all the different kinds of flavorings and additives within each label. There are simply thousands of options for water out there. We try everything that we can think of to make our water more appealing, more desirable, more purposeful, more thirst quenching, and we will drink as many of these as we can get our hands on in order to not feel thirsty. 
As commentator Stephanie Engelhart reminds us, we live in a culture where we're highly focused on the next best thing. We focus on the next best way to organize a closet, the next best item to buy. Our lives are always looking to the next thing when someone upsets us or they no longer fulfill our happiness. We walk away, look into our next relationship. Our souls rarely settle as our lives are planned and priced out and seeking perfection. Sadly, we do not even notice the aching question behind our search for the next best thing, the next best drink of water. We desire fulfillment and rest and joy that cannot be found in another person, in another place, or in another project. Yet we often don't see that the satisfaction that we so desire can only be filled by a Messiah who speaks truth in the Spirit. The Samaritan woman re reveals this truth about us. That, that we are blind to our own need until the anointed one opens in our eyes. That's it. That's it. Who is Jesus? Well, in this larger context, in all 42 of those first verses of chapter 4, Jesus reveals himself as living water, as prophet, and as Messiah. Now, those, left, those last two are left for my colleague next week, but for this morning, suffice it to say, that Jesus is the one, I'll say it again, who doesn't see race or gender or moral or economic status. Jesus is the one who is not phased by our sin. Jesus is the one who keeps it simple. He pursues us with his love and with his compassion. He invites us to come and receive the water from the source of, of true life, from the source of eternal life, no fireworks needed, no flavorings required, just a thirsty soul. As the worship team uh, comes back onto the platform, come on up now, guys. You might have noticed something up here in front of me. I'm going to come down to floor level, okay? So I'll be right back, I promise. Now, friends, I'm just going to keep this really simple. Maybe somebody's thirsty here today. I mean, you're physically thirsty. I can, I can, I can help you with that. Maybe, maybe somebody is spiritually thirsty. You know what? Jesus can help you with that. bottle of water, promise me you'll recycle the bottle. Okay? Just do that for me. There are no strings attached for you to come up, for you to say anything, for you to do anything other than to just come get a bottle of water, friends. Come to the water. It's that simple. And maybe it'll quench your physical thirst. But maybe through the rest of the morning it will remind you that Jesus is the source of your spiritual thirst. And that he can come for you today. And he can offer you
are here Touching every heart I worship you Oh, I worship you You are here Healing every
whose living water never, never runs out. Go from here today to love, to learn, and to serve in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good to see you.